How do we get out of this? Do we get out of it next month, next year? No. What I'm talking about is something long term, but I'm talking about we have to start positioning ourselves to get there. So what does it mean when I talk about um, the new economy? What does it mean when I talk about uh, service zones? What does it mean? Do I talk about new earners? And what those new earners are, what the challenges that we're going to face, and let me explain this and put a little bit of context. The new economy that we have to create in Barbados has addressed the growth challenge and the productivity challenge. So, uh, if you can bring those slides for those at home. There's a, slide two, growth challenges. So between 81 and 2021, 20, uh, Barbados has had 15, I want, you to, I, want you to, I want you to hear this, 15 years of real GDP decreases. 26 of real uh, GDP increases. So when you look at the league table of growth within the Caribbean, we are at the bottom. Somehow we like to think that we be punching above the wig and we are, we are at the bottom. If we want to create the society that we like and we want to enjoy, we have to move up that table. So give me a, let me give you an example of a country that's at the top of the table. Dominican Republic. Guess how many, guess how many year, real, uh, years of real GDP decreases they've had? Four. That, that's the kind of thing that we've got to produce. Belize, four. Mauritius, one. St. Kitts, they've had uh, seven. St. Lucia, 10, Dominica, 10, Bahamas, 10, Singapore, 4. So the countries that we may need to emulate, it's a simple thing. They just get more years of growth. We, on the other hand, we are with Trinidad, 15 years of real GDP decreases. Every other country in the top top tier is having between one and I would say, let's say one and nine or 10 years of real GDP decreases to achieve and to pay for the things that we want. So we have a growth challenge. We also have, um, if you go to the next slide, a productivity challenge. We also have a productivity challenge. So productivity in Barbados fell off in about early 90s, early 90s, somehow we stopped being productive. So our independence period was the most productive period of Barbados. Some of the estimates, as, uh, the analysis estimate that three quarters of all the growth, so you may talk about any decreases just now, Three quarters, and then go back to the growth, three quarters of all the growth that we've had in this country to build all these things that we see occurred in that independence period. And it occurred under our borough. In, in, in it, and it's an interesting context. There are reasons for it. We were growing the economy. We we're establishing new things. Obviously, you can get growth. All those things have to be taken in context. But the point is, the majority of our growth occurred at one period, and then by the mid-90s, we were just, we were almost managing decline. From then to pretty much now. Countries that have been doing well, when you go back to the same uh, Dominican Republic, productivity through the roof. So we've got a growth challenge, we've got a productivity challenge, we've got a debt challenge, and currently, add to that, we've got an issue of competence with the government. So how do we even get out of this? What do we have to do in order to create this new Barbados and to create the space that we want for our country? So, one of the things that I have talked about this for years, anybody who's following me can probably be a little bit bored, but we have to treat government. Government has to start to behave as if business and social enterprise. What does that mean? 
it means that we have to find, government has to create ways to open spaces for job development and for jobs. Government can use its levers to open spaces for people to create businesses and to create jobs. Everybody can be employed by the government. Everybody can get a government pick. It can't happen. So if everybody can't get government pick, where are they going to be employed? They have to be able to create their own businesses. That business is either here or that business is somewhere else. They're living here, but they're earning globally. So I, I can use a phrase, a, a, a barnet from a friend, and I see he's here smiling. They can live locally, earn globally. And that's where we have to pitch. That's where we're going. Or even if you're living here and earning locally, you are not necessarily a government employee because government can't employ everyone. That's just the reality. We could pretend to, but it can't. So what other areas can we create employment in? We can, and this is something I've talked about, service zones. What is a service zone? How do we, how do we kind of uh, rocket boost our, 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 our financial sector and our international um, business sector and how do we create new spaces for new jobs. Now, a service zone is not simply trying to repeat um, early pre and post industrialization by invitation and the exclusive economic zones uh, that we had which like tourism can contribute to economic growth but do not contribute to economic development. Realize there's a difference there. Because there's no technology transfer, there's no innovation. You're not creating a learning economy when, you, when, you, when you're, you're tourist-based economy. So tourism can create the ability to pay for things, because you get foreign exchange, but there's no transfer of knowledge. We know this. There's no innovation. There's usually sometimes no linkages because half the things you want to support the industry, you end up importing, so you're taking the same foreign exchange to, to, to drive the industry. So right now, there are people asking the question, is tourism actually contributing to our economic development? Seri serious question. And they're trying to go through the deal, is tourism worth it? That's a serious question. That's something we have to think about, but for now, let's park it. So what is a service zone? We're talking about a physical space, we're talking about centers, we're talking about hubs that can support finance, banking, tech, shipping, arbitration. They've done something like this in Dubai. The International Financial uh, Center, which is the financial free zone, is a financial hub for the Middle East, Africa, South Asia, or the Shanghai uh, free zone and arbitration center. You can pull up the next slide. Sir. So what is it required to set up a service zone? It requires a set of laws to govern the behavior of the people, businesses in and outside of the zone. And importantly, what you need to do, and this is my, my legal hat on here, you are literally creating a legal space or a system by which an economic system can develop around. This is all it is. You're just creating rules by which everybody can behave in that space. So what do you need to get it? properly designed incentive packages for mature businesses and startups. So you're not simply trying to give people tax breaks, exorbitant tax breaks, to learn to Barbados, to dig out the eye, make money, ship it somewhere else, and we still don't benefit, and claim, my empl I employ 50 people, so I'm doing something for Barbados. No, you're not. A business has to employ people. I don't know why we just brag, all the business employ people. But obviously you have to, who gonna work? The ghost? Somebody got, you got to employ somebody. So that is not something to brag about. My business employs 50 people. I've come to Barbados and I've employed 50 people. So we're supposed to give you the country, the keys, the kingdom and everything because you got to employ 50 people? No. So the incentive packages have to be realistic to the kind of Barbados that we want to create. No, so it's not simply about giving you tax breaks and exorbitant tax breaks because you are going to come and then we're going to put it in a, in a brochure. Barbados has an international firm AB or whatever and you know, we're, we're doing well. And then when you drill down, you had to employ 50 people, they don't really pay the tax. Cooperation tax, you reduce from 30% to base rates of 1%. So the main paying the taxes 
uh, but you're going to put it in a glossy magazine because you want to look like you're attracting business to Barbados. But how are they benefiting this country? They do not. That's the problem. Now, the development of large-scale projects must be tied to the development of the social capital of this country. So if you are coming here and you want to build a Hyatt, what are you doing for Bridgetown? Which school that you going to sponsor? What is the private-public sector partnership that will develop to ensure that you start funding a school within your environs? Which labs you paying for? Which roads are you going to pave in the communities around and to your businesses? What community centers will you be building in your area? This is how we have to start thinking about development. You just can't come here and bulldoze a space, build a big high rise, do you think, make you money. The communities around you are in the same spaces. The schools around you have not improved. You have not contributed to the social capital or developed the country. 10, 20 years later, the building run down, you pack up your briefcase, pack up your profits, and you go along with your business. And you left and you leave us there holding the bag. The politicians who bragged about creating 100 jobs, $200 million in investment, I, I, I just be bewildered when I start talking, you know. Yes, we are doing so well. How? It has to stop. We have to start getting serious about what kind of development do we want for Barbados. Yes, nobody against foreign investment. Of course, come to Barbados. Of course, build whatever you need to build that is in, in congruence with our laws and our, and our development of our country. But how are you tied in the development of the country? And that is the way that international investment and national development is going. That is what you're talking about when you talk about good corporate social citizens. All that has to be tied in. So social service zones aren't necessarily about building new edifices of concrete. You can use existing brownfield um, sites. And some of the other things that we can do with these zones, you can create arbitration hubs, shipping hubs, logistic hubs. You can offer professional services, attract new businesses, attract new investments to Barbados. You can use it as a space to test financial products, um, build out blockchain or all the technologies that you want, electronic contracts, all of these things. You can allow English and New York law to be used. For example, Service Zone could provide for um, a Shanghai arbitration center so that there's arbitration disputes that can take place governing Chinese law. We could be a first. There's no point pretending that China is not a major development partner of the Caribbean and that China is not a major economic power of the world. So how do we, how do we leverage that relationship to benefit us, not to disadvantage us? Are there disputes that will be happening within the region with Chinese investments? Of course there will be. Could there be an outpost of an arbitration center in the Caribbean to handle those disputes in the place? Yes, we can do that. The point is, Barbados could possibly be a hub for development for, in the Caribbean, Latin America, for investment as it relates to China. Service zones have potential to be the next thing. Because what they can do also is that they can create that learning society that tourism did not create. They can be a hub to do all the things, attract financial businesses, logistics, arbitration, tech, and you have them sitting neatly in the center. We can find creative ways to create that new economy to drive the development of this country and to pay the bills for the things that we like. So, so one of the key, the key um, things in creating this ecosystem, tax and investment incentives, community investment, simplified customs, planning, because you, you don't want to use greenfield sites, integration into economic areas such as renewables and agriculture, and important, I can't keep stressing this, it creates that learning society. Because if you are coming here and you are setting up businesses and you're doing things, there has to be knowledge transfer. We cannot simply be getting the lowest paced jobs at the bottom of your investment profile. We have to be part of middle 
and upper management of these companies, we have to be learning things. Because we have to be do things. And none of this in you, I don't understand. Sometimes we've been talking about this since the 80s. And we seem not to be able to do anything because we fall back on platitudes and politics. Making big promises which we know we cannot keep in order to simply get a vote. And then when it's done, everybody disappointed. The voter is disappointed. Nothing happened. The boy ain't doing nothing. You, the, 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 the government, probably disappointed because you don't understand what they can't be grateful. But what are they going to be grateful for? You ain't doing nothing. So we can create these service zones as a new pillar of the economy. They can be a vehicle for international business. They can give it a boost. Tourism can continue. But the future has to come in finding ways that bring investment to drive the development of this country. And not only bring investment, but create homegrown opportunities for investment. So recently I saw, I saw something. This is not to knock it about a rum factory uh, coming to Barbados. I'm like, wait, wait, wait. You telling me nobody in Barbados can set up another rum factory? Nobody, but hey, don't. We just drink enough of it. I was sure we know to make it. Nobody here could have set up a rum factory? No, you tell me that there's nobody here that could get together, get the right investment packages together, get some investors, get the bank, maybe a little uh, underwriting by the government for a certain percentage to sell it and got some stability and to set up this rum factory. Why are we thinking we always need to depend on something outside? And they ain't gonna do nothing special. They're gonna buy an old plantation, they're gonna retrofit it, put the, uh, the vats in, the tanks, bring some barrels, slap a label on it, um, you know, special rum connoisseur in the fields and hills of Barbados. You can get a video, beautiful flowing music. You can see some canes and uh, maybe a few smiling people. And they can sell that at premium, make enough money, employ some people. Yes, of course they're employing some people. But how are we benefiting? How, how have we become wealth creators and wealth generators? We still just in the field, though. I talk in Frank. We ain't own nothing. We still depending on somebody else. All of these projects that you see, are you telling me there is no one competent and capable here? Every job you open the paper, somebody coming in, what you tell? So why what, how all this education? You tell me nobody can be an accountant? Nobody can be a beverage service food manager? Nobody you know to be a wine connoisseur. Uh, we call it a sommelier. Not all, every day opening paper. It's ridiculous. How does that create a learning society? And then people leave and we wonder why they're leaving. So, and importantly, this is the, the last bit, um, so I'm getting there. The last bit of this presentation is that I want to talk about some development tests. So if you're going to create a new basis for economic and wealth generation because you want people to own their economy, to drive the country, there has to also be, there also has to be a way to test that. So there has to be a certain series of questions that every single set of investment should have to pass. So for example, does the investment make local landowners part of the project to benefit directly, financially, or from shares in the profit? So the people that live in Bridgetown, that live in Nelson Street, and cross there by, um, by Bay Street, any of them got investments in Hayat? They gonna benefit? They might ask them to come in and work them as maids and cleaners, but they're going to benefit from Hayat. They got shares in that. Did anyone think, okay, how many people live in the environs? Okay, we, this will be a major part of a project in your neighborhood. Are there ways to integrate you within the development of this project? All right, can we give you a percentage? Say, you know, I just want an arbitrary number. Let me set aside 5%, split it up among you. You know, every, every year, whatever you get, premium, a couple hundred dollars. 
You gotta start thinking, people. You gotta start thinking about wealth creation, generational wealth. Anybody think about that? Any of these projects that are built, do anybody in the areas own something or part of them? Have they been asked? Have you invited them? Have you talked to them about how to create the packages? You're probably a man, they ain't got the money, but you gotta help. You gotta create the ladder. Now, the second question for any project, does it contribute to the socio-economic development of Barbados? In simple terms, does it help to pay for uh, social services, such as education and health? So our, our thinking about projects has to go beyond, when you hear, the, when you hear a minister announce a project and he said 100 million and 50 jobs, ask the next question, that's base thinking. Of course, it got to create jobs and it got to be an investment. What is the next step? Is that project contributing to paying for education and, 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 and health? Outside of taxation, are you talking about have they, have they entered into some kind of partnership with a local school? Have they entered into a partnership with a local clinic? Have they entered a partnership with a community center? Have they identified, okay, you know what? I got 10 rows around Nelson Street that I want paving. Hot scat thing, okay, I can pay five. All right, that's my contribution to, to social welfare and capital of this country. And then I can go into a contract, I will be responsible for these five rows for the next 10 years or something. That's pressure off the government. Because you just can't, it's not just about you making money, filling your profits and your, and your, and your books, and then you flying on the Barbados and doing well, but all the services and things around these spaces pop down people ain't living proper lives, and you're creating a have and a have not society. That cannot work. I will not have it. Not in this country. Not, but here, somebody says. <laughs> the other question, does the project or the investment contribute to infrastructural development of Barbados? So again, as we're saying, do they ensure surrounding housing, community centers, parks, roads are upgraded, all these things. Does the project provide for economic empowerment of Barbadians? This is not simply, as I said, about providing jobs and bragging about a provider job, but what type of jobs? How do these jobs pay? You got people in the tourism sector, as we heard last week from, 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 from one of our colleagues, making $1,700, $1,500 a month but they will bring in somebody in the same job and get them $20,000, a car, tuition for their children at a private school, and a, a, a trip every year back to home. Same job, but they're gonna pay the local person $1,500 or $1,700 a month, and that person has a family to feed. Barbadians must have opportunities to create and grow existing businesses, not only gain employment, I think the government's talking about, about employment as if that is something to, to, to always check. Where are the other things? You create jobs, yes, but what are the other things you're doing? How are these people getting wealth? How are they able to then create another generation of their family that will not be dependent on government for handouts? They then will be able to help somebody else. How are they then not going to own not only the mother house, but going to be able to create another house? How are they then not only be able to, to not only go and have a first degree, but their children might be able to do a master? It's always the next level. Their parents might have $50,000 in the bank account. They should have 100. They should have got less. Everything has to... In so... Investment and creation of a new economy cannot simply be about job creation. That's one aspect. The most basic of aspects, it has to go beyond that. Has to lift, we gotta lift the game. So, does the project, another test, create, provide for wealth creation opportunities for Barbadians in that these projects and these investments have to buy goods they have to procure their goods and services from small to medium-sized businesses in Barbados. The government promised this. What, 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 how much is the promise that, that the government should buy um, goods and services from small, and they don't do it? 
Furthermore, the register that they were supposed to set up to let me know who the contract's going to, well, well then set up. We ain't got the transparency there. So millions, we still don't know where these contracts going. We were promised it. We were promised integrity law. Still it happened. So all of these are the kind of things that we have to start thinking seriously about in terms of pushing this country forward. So what is the way forward? Service zones, support the development through the outline of businesses uh, to define the zones, tax and customs incentives, and how to measure it, ensure that the developments are not only for that project but for the wider economy. And you have the government behaving as a business and a social enterprise and not as a victim. We can't guilt the West into helping us. We, it is time, yes, we understand the history, we know what happened, we can fight for reparations. That's a separate debate. But we also have to recognize that if our country is going to change, we have to be the drivers of that. The productivity challenge that I just talked about, that is we do. Why we fall off? Why we ain't producing? That is us. There's nobody outside of Barbados. That is a, that's an issue that we have to mount. The growth challenge, that's an issue we have to mount. Why are, are is Mauritius and Singapore and Belize and all these other countries, and Louis, why are they growing and we are not? Why are we at the bottom of lead cables for growth? Why are we having more looking, pushing more years of non-growth than years of growth? The government talks about 10% economic growth, but that's a fallacy. I wish we would start telling the truth. We know the 10% that we're going to get, and then the 4% that, uh, that they predicted um, this, this year, we know that that barely makes up for the last five years. So technically, we have not had growth for the last five years. The Barbados economy is probably no more than 1, 1.5% larger than when this government took office. That's just the reality. If you tell the truth, then at least you might be able to figure some way out of it. Stop trying to pretend and load the statistics as if, as if they're real. There's no way that that unemployment number could be true. But when you're pretending, you're not helping anybody. That doesn't help the country. You have to be honest with the country. The very way that I'm honest with this party. Sometimes people give me lashes for it, but that's me. I can be honest with the country. I ain't here to tell you all the lies. You have to then make the decision as to, wait, this, this man telling me the truth. Okay, all right. This, this is something that I could get involved in. This looks like a direction that I, that I can take, that I can, that I can be part of. 